To Nietzsche and the genealogy of morality, morality itself varies dependent upon who uses the term. To Nietzsche, there is a morality for both masters and slaves, each varying. To the slave, morality stems from kindness and empathy, stemming from Christian ideologies, whereas master morality places emphasis on power and a sense of pride. To quote Nietzsche, the democratic movement is the heir to Christianity, and hence slave morality. In short, morality cannot be separate from the culture it comes from, shaped by social circumstance. Thus, it is through culture that one conceptualizes. Needless to say, as we discussed previously, when cultures cannot coincide on a shared concept, conflict is generally an end result, leading to a sense of power struggle between opposing groups of people. Like how the sun makes for shadow, master morality, by being oppressive, creates slave morality, which condemns oppression. The slave essentially devalues what the master values. What the master deems good, the slave deems bad, and vice versa. Though Nietzsche sticks to master-slave morality, this concept applies across all cultures, where men value different meanings. In places where meaning conflicts, conflict generally occurs. Meaning we see is created by associating with cultural signs and symbols, generated by the shared mode of linguistically developed discourse of a said societal establishment. To thinkers like Richard Rorty, truth cannot be found out in the world, as truth is a byproduct of language which is absent from the silent indifference of an impartial planet. To quote Rorty, truth cannot be out there, cannot exist independently of the human mind, because sentences cannot so exist or be out there. The world is out there, but descriptions of the world are not. Conversely, in opposition to this premise was Bernard Williams in his work Truth and Truthfulness, which addresses the concerns presented with the loss of truth and its impact upon people, as well as its deeper philosophical implications of truth denial, using a genealogical or historical framework as opposed to a Marxist framework of analyzing the dominant mode of discourse. The question and concern remains, what happens when no universal truth can be established outside of the realm of interpretation? For Foucault, genealogy is not linear, however, but rather somewhat relative, as knowledge and power through the concept of power knowledge are linked, where power shapes knowledge and perception, and vice versa. As such, truth can be untrustworthy from a historical or contextual standpoint. Thus, how does one find the origins of anything truthful in a linear fashion if past truths are open to power knowledge interpretations? Since truths can be inconsistent, there can be no one universal or linear timeline on which to look. Genealogy thus deconstructs truth in the Derridian sense, opening historicity up to new interpretations, where there may not be one, but rather a multitude of historical meanings. As such, who can say with certainty where relative history even starts? This postmodern perspective brought on by late capitalism, as we discussed, opens us up to one, ontologies, where the past operates at present, two, the prominence of pastiche, and three, lost futures, due to our inability to find or even create a linear historicity any longer. As such, the postmodern perspective to Jameson becomes a proponent of capitalistic practices. Postmodernism has assisted in the acceleration of capitalism itself where truth cannot be claimed outside of culture, left to a seemingly inescapable relative time state, ambivalently leaving us everywhere and yet nowhere at once, caught on the internet's rhizomatic expanse, injected with overwhelming amounts of paralyzing, sedative-inducing information that offers us no hope of any escape.